Lectures to my students. A selection of addresses delivered to the students of the Pastors College Metropolitan Tabernacle by C. H. Spurgeon, President. Lecture number three. The Preacher's Private Prayer. Of course, the preacher is, above all others, distinguished as a man of prayer. He prays as an ordinary Christian, else he were a hypocrite. He prays more than ordinary Christians, else he were disqualified for the office which he has undertaken. It would be wholly monstrous, says Bernard, for a man to be highest in office and lowest in soul first in station, and last in life. Overall, his other relationships, the preeminence of the pastor's responsibility, casts a halo, and, if true to his master, he becomes distinguished for his prayerfulness in them all. As a citizen, his country has the advantage of his intercession. As a neighbour, those under his shadow are remembered in supplication. He prays as a husband and as a father. He strives to make his family devotions a model for his flock. And if the fire on the altar of God should burn low anywhere else, it is well tended in the house of the Lord's chosen servant. For he takes care that the morning and evening sacrifice shall sanctify his dwelling. But there are some of his prayers which concern his office, and of those our plan in these lectures leads us to speak most. He offers peculiar supplications as a minister, and he draws near to God in this respect, over and above all his approaches in his other relationships. I take it that as a minister he is always praying. Whenever his mind turns to his work, whether he is in it or out of it, he ejaculates a petition, sending up his holy desires as well-directed arrows to the skies. He is not always in the act of prayer, but he lives in the spirit of it. If his heart be in his work, he cannot eat or drink or take recreation or go to his bed or rise in the morning, without ever more feeling a fervency of desire, a weight of anxiety, and a simplicity of dependence upon God. Thus, in one form or other, he continues in prayer. If there be any man under heaven who is compelled to carry out the precept, pray without ceasing, surely it is the Christian minister. He has peculiar temptations, special trials, singular difficulties, and remarkable duties. He has to deal with God in awful relationships, and with men in mysterious interests. He therefore needs much more grace than common men, and, as he knows this, he is led constantly to cry to the strong for strength, and say, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. Elaine once wrote to a dear friend, Though I am apt to be unsettled and quickly set off the hinges, yet, methinks, I am like a bird out of the nest. I am never quiet till I am in my old way of communion with God, like the needle in the compass that is restless till it be turned towards the pole. I can say, through grace, with the church, with my soul have I desired thee in the night, and with my spirit within me have I sought thee early. My heart is early and late with God. It is the business and delight of my life to seek him. Such must be the even tenor of your way, O men of God. If you, as ministers, are not very prayerful, you are much to be pitied. If, in the future... You shall be called to sustain pastorates, large or small. If you become lax in secret devotion, not only will you need to be pitied, but your people also. 
and in addition to that you shall be blamed and the day cometh in which you shall be ashamed and confounded it may scarcely be needful to commend to you the sweet uses of private devotion and yet I cannot forbear to you as the ambassadors of God the mercy seat has a virtue beyond all estimates the more familiar you are with the court of heaven the better shall you discharge your heavenly trust among all the formative influences which go to make up a man honored of God in the ministry I know of none more mighty than his own familiarity with the mercy seat all that a college course can do for a student is coarse and external compared with the spiritual and delicate refinement obtained by communion with God while the unformed minister is revolving upon the wheel of preparation prayer is the tool of the great potter by which he molds the vessel all our libraries and studies are mere emptiness compared with our closets we grow we wax mighty we prevail in private prayer your prayers will be your ablest assistance while your discourses are set upon the anvil while other men like Esau are hunting for their portion you by the aid of prayer will find the savory meat near at home and may say in truth what Jacob said so falsely the Lord brought it to me if you can dip your pens into your hearts appealing in earnestness to the Lord you will write well and if you can gather your matter on your knees at the gate of heaven you will not fail to speak well prayer as a mental exercise will bring many subjects before the mind and so help in the selection of a topic while as a high spiritual engagement it will cleanse your inner eye that you may see truth in the light of God texts will often refuse to reveal their treasures till you open them with the key of prayer how wonderfully were the books opened to Daniel when he was in supplication how much Peter learned upon the housetop the closet is the best study the commentators are good instructors but the author himself is far better and prayer makes a direct appeal to him and enlists him in our cause it is a great thing to pray oneself into the spirit and marrow of a text working into it by sacred feeding thereon even as the worm bores its way into the kernel of the nut prayer supplies a leverage for the uplifting of ponderous truths one marvels how the stones of Stonehenge could have been set in their places it is even more to be inquired after whence some men obtained such admirable knowledge of mysterious doctrines was not prayer the potent machinery which wrought the wonder waiting upon God often turns darkness into light persevering inquiry at the sacred Oracle uplifts the veil and gives grace to look into the deep things of God a certain Puritan divine at a debate was observed frequently to write upon the paper before him upon others curiously seeking to read his notes they found nothing upon the page but the words more light Lord more light Lord repeated scores of times a most suitable prayer for the student of the word when preparing his discourse you will frequently find fresh streams of thought leaping up from the passage before you as if the rock had been struck by Moses rod new veins of precious ore will be revealed to your astonished gaze as you quarry God's word and use diligently the hammer of prayer you will sometimes feel as if you were entirely shut up and then suddenly a new road will open before you he who hath the key of David openeth and no man shutteth if you have ever sailed down the Rhine 
the water scenery of that majestic river will have struck you as being very like in effect to a series of lakes. Before and behind the vessel appears to be enclosed in massive walls of rock or circles of vine-clad terraces till on a sudden you turn a corner and before you the rejoicing and abounding river flows onward in its strength. So the laborious student often finds it with a text. It appears to be fast closed against you, but prayer propels your vessel and turns its prow into fresh waters, and you behold the broad and deep stream of sacred truth flowing in its fullness and bearing you with it. Is not this a convincing reason for abiding in supplication? Use prayer as a boring rod, and wells of living water will leap up from the bowels of the word. Who will be content to thirst when living waters are so readily to be obtained? The best and holiest men have ever made prayer the most important part of pulpit preparation. It is said of McShane, and here Spurgeon pens a note to say, Memoir and Remains of the Reverend Robert Murray McShane. This is one of the best and most profitable volumes ever published. Every minister should read it often. And then he goes on to quote, and he says, Anxious to give his people on the Sabbath what had cost him somewhat, he never, without an urgent reason, went before them, without much previous meditation and prayer. His principle on this subject was embodied in a remark he made to some of us who were conversing on the matter. Being asked his view of diligent preparation for the pulpit, he reminded us of Exodus 27 verse 20. Beaten oil, beaten oil for the lamps of the sanctuary. And yet his prayerfulness was greater still. Indeed, he could not neglect fellowship with God before entering the congregation. He needed to be bathed in the love of God. His ministry was so much a bringing out of views that had first sanctified his own soul, that the healthiness of his soul was absolutely needful to the vigour and power of his ministrations. With him, the commencement of all labour invariably consisted in the preparation of his own soul. The walls of his chamber were witnesses of his prayerfulness and of his tears, as well as of his cries. Prayer will singularly assist you in the delivery of your sermon. In fact, nothing can so gloriously fit you to preach as descending fresh from the Mount of Communion with God to speak with men. None are so able to plead with men as those who have been wrestling with God on their behalf. It is said of Elaine, he poured out his very heart in prayer and preaching. His supplications and his exhortations were so affectionate, so full of holy zeal, life and vigour, that they quite overcame his hearers. He melted over them, so that he thawed and mollified and sometimes dissolved the hardest hearts. There could have been none of his sacred dissolving of heart if his mind had not been previously exposed to the tropical rays of the Son of Righteousness by private fellowship with the risen Lord. A truly pathetic delivery, in which there is no affectation, but much affection, can only be the offspring of prayer. There is no rhetoric like that of the heart, and no school of learning it but the foot of the cross. It were better that you never learned a rule of human oratory, but were full of the power of heaven-born love, than that you should master Quintilian, Cicero and Aristotle, and remain without the apostolic anointing. Prayer may not make you eloquent after the human mode, but it will make you truly so, for you will speak out of the heart. And is not that the meaning of the word eloquence? It will bring fire from heaven upon your sacrifice and thus prove it to be accepted of the Lord.